uh, officially start. Uh, those who join will, will catch up with us, I'm sure. Uh, welcome everybody to what's the last meeting of this season. Um, it's been an odd season with uh, all this technology, but I think we've sort of beginning to grasp it now and perhaps almost embrace it, some of us. Uh, can I just ask those of you who come? to see beyond the uh, <laughs> your audio. I think that might be Dave and Sue. <laughs> um, so that, uh, and also turn off your cameras so that our speaker can speak to you without distractions of people doing strange things um, during his talk. Um, I'm sure he won't do that. Anyway. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Marcus Britton, and uh, he works at the Cambridge Archaeological Unit in Cambridge, where he engages with a spectrum of fieldwork and research programs that promote a collaboration of commercial, academic, and public engagements in archaeology. His interests are broad. Often, though, so often engagements in archaeology, so his interests are broad, although often return to pioneer communities of the later prehistoric and later historical eras. He mainly conducts his field work in Britain and its overseas territories, and also in various parts of Africa. He is a member of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists and a member of the Macdonald Institute for Archaeological Research at the University of Cambridge. His current projects include the development of Hillfort communities, ethno-archaeology of East African agriculturalism, Socialist communities in the 19th century Britain, Antarctic occupation and hunting in the 18th and 19th centuries, and archaeology in post conflict society using archival sources in a project entitled Making Peace with the Past Archaeology After the First World War. So, as you can hear, a wide and varied interests, wide and varied interests, one of which is the main ecology about which he will tell us this evening. So I'll ask him now to share his screen with us and uh, talk to us, please, about this. Unmute, great. Good, yes, yeah, so a broad range of interest, as you can tell. I'm actually speaking to you as the um, recent field archaeologist in residence in the Macdonald Institute, um, where I'm writing up my work in the Falkland Islands and South Georgia, so very much an Antarctic world. And whilst that's completely different to what I'm talking about today, it is at least the same era, um, the 19th century, so we're in the right place. So my subject today really is the unusual history um, of a social experiment um, conducted in a field between uh, Maney and Welney in the Cambridgeshire Fenland. Just try and close this. Ah, there we are. Um, now this occurred almost well, 200 years ago. Um, and I want to talk about the results of an archeological project um, that uh, was conducted there in 2016. So the focus here is of just two years in the first half of the 19th century. Um, but that needle in the haystack can only be addressed from an archaeological perspective by looking also at another 200 or so years of the site's history. Now, this is all part of what was the Ooze Washes, Ooze Washes Landscape Partnership, um, where we worked with local organisations and volunteers as part of a heritage lottery funded project, focused very much on the land and the water connected by the old and new Bedford rivers. Um, and amongst the different projects that we did, we looked at the, a Roman villa in Fendrayton and the Civil War bulwark fortifications at Erith, and various scientific experiments that took advantage of the long, straight and flat character of the ooze washes. Um, included there is the 19th century flat earth trials, um, one of which was actually carried out by a former member of the Maine Fen colony that I'll talk about in a moment, and the 1960s and 1970s tract hovercraft between Erith and Sutton Gold. Um, there's various reports and films um, on all of these projects on YouTube, and there's gonna be various links um, at the end of this presentation um, through which you can find those. 
So in August 1838, a landowner and businessman from Upwell named William Hodson published a pamphlet entitled Each for All to the Working Classes, the Real Producers of Wealth, in which he proclaimed that he had begun construction of a new form of cooperative society in which no member would spoil their hat in bowing to superiors. All will be equal and where envy, strife, and all uncharitableness will find little food under such arrangements. And exactly one year later, William Cutting, a member and trustee of the newly formed colony, claimed further grounds of confidence. In seven years from this, he wrote, Maine Fenn will present the appearance of a paradise. I would not go to live permanently in old society again. At its zenith, the colony may have numbered anywhere between 50 and 100 members, and the project was regarded by its supporters as a foundation to a long-term and grand vision for a new world order. Like many utopian projects, both before and since, the scale of this vision was immense. It was envisaged that word of the colony's success would travel far and wide across Britain, then to Europe, and then to all parts of the world, and would in essence transform and ultimately save the human condition from the inequalities and irrationalities that were induced by modern life. It's in many ways remarkable that such an ambitious project was begun in the Fenland, which in the earlier 19th century was not highly regarded as an exemplar of technological or social innovation, um, significant economic opportunity, or indeed aesthetic appeal. And there is little on the site of the colony today that may indicate this to be of any notable historical importance. One reason for this may be that the colony was dissolved just 25 months into its establishment, for which a list of reasons may be cited that include clashes in personality, a lack of external support and, well, ongoing financial strain. However, the Maine colony is an important site in the context of the development of socialist and community Unitarian philosophy, particularly the so-called utopian movement of the 19th century. Only since the early 2000s have utopian communities been a subject of archaeological interest. At the core of this interest is the view that 19th century experiments in utopian society arise out of a specific historical context. So their study allows for an alternative entry into the development of modern society, as well as, well, modernity in general. But whilst there is a growing number of archaeological projects focused on 19th century utopian communities in the United States, these have been largely neglected in Britain. And the fieldwork at Maney, even though it's now five years old, still remains the only fieldwork investigation of a formal experiment in utopian infrastructure. So what are the challenges for an archaeology of a 19th century utopia at Maine Fen? Well, the historical sources are very fragmentary. There's few witness accounts or doc documentary um, archives. Um, many of the sources are probably biased. But there are some strong local histories, and many of these are useful. Um, others, um, particularly the historical sources, are perhaps not so much. And of course, there's no photography. We're just before that photography timeline. So um, as you know, much as the case for most archeological projects that we work with. But above all, it's the short duration of the community, 25 months, that provides the greatest challenge. Uh, this is our needle in a haystack. So we need to begin with some frame of context. So the 1830s, an era of social contrasts, now this slide is rather obvious emphasis of the opposite poles of social extremes that pervade literature of the first half of the 19th century. Um, they're both from 1837, 1838, and they coincide, of course, with the establishment of Maine Colony. In the top left is a still from David Lyon's uh, 1948 interpretation of the hardships depicted in Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist. And the bottom right is a magazine illustration of the public displays of pomp and ceremony that surrounded Queen Victoria's accession. Um, this is actually an example from a procession in Wisbeach. Between the 1770s and the 1830s, that's a period of some 60 years, 
Britain experienced cycles of crop failures, military conflict, uh, saw cycles by which prices of goods repeatedly rose and then rapidly fell. Some basic goods such as bread, for example, were continuously expensive and the Corn Laws of 1815 maintained a basic high cost for cereals, even during economic downturns. Now, whereas across this 60 year period, the basic cost of living fell overall for the British population, household incomes of the laboring classes were swallowed by increases in the price of property and land rents. Now, adding to this, uh, by the 1830s, all exports had begun to decrease, wages had fallen by as much as 6%, and unemployment had doubled to 10%. Sanitation was poor in Britain's towns and outbreaks of cholera were increasingly frequent. And to many social commentators of the time, there was a general sense that social morality was weakening across the nation and most notably amongst the labouring classes. Now, whereas it was once possible to alleviate unemployment through opportunistic labour in local agriculture, this was eradicated by the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834. It actually says 1934, sorry about that, but it's 1834, you can be assured. And this transformed the system of poor relief by its centralization into the workhouse. Now, the effect was a manner of ring fencing around well, personal aspiration, and the number of dependent poor swelled to unprecedented levels. Adding to this was an incremental growth of the national population, coupled with the increasingly young range of the age groups represented across the overall labor force. By contrast, the scale of the agricultural labor force was shrinking, but the habits of working life were changing as time itself was becoming disciplined and commodified, such as by the Factory Act of 1833 that regulated the natural rhythms of activity and rest in the workplace. And across this 60 year period, um, attended to the working week increased by 25%, equating to 3,000 working hours per person per annum or 8.2 working hours per day over a seven day working week. Production and ownership of timepieces, especially wash watches, also escalated. Now accounts of alternative forms of society, especially through communal living were numerous and served as a response to the structural circumstances that manifested such impacts upon human lives. Of the more popular dialogues, the works of Robert Owen were particularly influential. Now, Robert Owen was a Welsh industrialist with a belief that substantial systemic changes should be enacted to accommodate an environment more suitable for the health and well-being of people and society in general. In 1800, Owen followed his father-in-law as manager of the new Lanark cotton mills in Scotland. There he wished to improve upon working conditions and argued that happy and healthy workers are as important as making money, though ultimately should also lead to greater productivity. At the core of this improvement was educational reform centered upon the idea of cooperation as a common aim. Now, Owen foregrounded reason as being unique to humanity, but argued that it was impoverished under the present circumstances of industrial society amidst a rigid Christian dogma. Human character, he believed, was molded by the physical and cultural environment. So by identifying the optimum combination of these, the human condition could be significantly improved. Cooperation working, sorry, cooperative working was just the beginning of Owen's vision. For a truly cooperative society, Owen des designed a series of models for communal living. The foundation of an ideal community was based each time on the layout of a quadrangle. This enabled a geometric ordering of daily living spaces with spaces dedicated to different age groups, genders, and familial status with communal and educational spaces at the center. And in the 1820s, Owen traveled to America to establish his ideals of communitarianism at New Harmony 
in Indiana. And though attracting moderate interest, his American experience ultimately was, was short-lived. However, by the 1830s, there was a growing Owenite movement in the United Kingdom. This was a highly structured organization with over 50 district offices and over 3,000 subscribing, that's paying, members. And the primary aim of this movement was to raise enough funds for the establishment of an experimental community. And in July of 1838, as part of a tour across the east of England, Owen's, uh, Owen lectured in the Fenland town of March. Chairing that session was one William Hodson. Now Hodson was a colorful character, a one-time sailor, a Methodist preacher. He was involved with local government and wrote various radical criticisms of the poor laws, the tithe system and the priesthood. And letters between Hodson and Owen suggest that Hodson wished to help the Owenites in their venture of purchasing land near to Wisbeach. Though it's more likely that Owen harbored doubt in such a partnership. And it's quite frankly, no surprise. Hodson had claimed to own the 1000 acres of land that was for sale, brokering the venture through James Hill, a banker in Wisbeach. And it became apparent that Hodson did not yet own the land but would have filed a profit of some £7,000 had the sale gone through. The 150-acre plot at Maney was proposed as an alternative by Hodson, but evident conflict between Hodson's previous misadventure, his ambition, and the views of the Owenites establishment saw this too fall through. Instead, Hodson swiftly purchased the land, um, and this was a plot that had been rented by his family since at least 1829, and he advertised for members to join his own experimental community. Hodson subsequently further angered the Owenites by poaching their schoolmaster, E.T. Craig, and such actions would have long-term ramifications for the colony. Though many commentators disputed this, the site did actually have many perceived qualities. It had good quality soil in flat and, well, cheap arable land. And Hodson was adamant that he could improve its productivity. He used to experiment with chemistry, uh, effectively um, bioagriculture, and was uh, quite successful on the speaking circuit on those topics. And there was a pre-existing quarry, um, the aggregate, which could be used as building material. Um, obviously, the, uh, the material needed to build the colony itself, its infrastructure. And there was access to the site via the long, straight Bedford River the superhighway of the Fens, which would be used to transport and sell goods, such as building materials made from the quarry material um, and other goods uh, made by the colony, various craft works and so on. By July 1838, the Maney Fen, or what was also known as the Hodsonian community, was officially established. Membership of any individual was subject to a strict contract. Included in this was that Hodson's payment for the land would be returned and with interest by its colonists who eventually would be fully self-sustainable. There was a book of 45 rules that covered etiquette, behavior, moral principles and strict adherence to the cause of communality. The contract bound the individual to the society, including all their worldly goods, as well as the upbringing of their children. The first intake of colonists was near disastrous. Reports of drinking, laziness, fornication quickly emerged, and Hodson was forced to evict various members owing to a lack of conviction to communitarianism. News reports in the local and national press quickly became distorted, especially around Hodson's views on marriage, which he believed to be contrary to the principles of commun communitarianism. He was accused of building his own harem. Now we sort of suffered the same misreportage when we were excavating at the site in 2015. In order to counter the bad press, and present an insider's view of the colony, a printing press was established on site in 1840 to produce a weekly magazine, The Working Bee. 
And this provided valuable insight into the, the inner working life of the colony, the infrastructure that they were able to establish, um, and various outsiders' views as well in response. But I think ultimately we can take many of the texts throughout this magazine as being biased, or at least we have to test them on the basis that they may be biased. Now, the working bee contains the only known representation of the colony as viewed from the Old Bedford River in 1841. Now, this might be part of a visual culture very specific to landscape perspectives depicted across Georgian and Victorian England. And we don't know if this is a view of what was built um, or what was going to be built um, or what ultimately was imagined might be built in the future. But it does show two sides of a model tri uh, quadrangle constructed of brick and tiled buildings. And there's between 12 and 14, uh, 24 rather, private cottages and a dormitory that would separate married and unmarried tenants and their children, as well as hired laborers. And the aim, according to the working bee, was to erect 100 houses in just two years. Ultimately, the aim was that multiple quadrangles would then be built, all linked together, expanding the community into well, the full 150 acres. In addition were two large communal rooms that served various functions, including a dining space, a library, the printing press, a theater, and there was a single large kitchen and wash house. Uh, numerous barns and workshops, um, including a smithy, were also present. And the buildings were to be heated by a, a centralized Arnott stove. Now this was a state of the art system, um, the best that money could buy, that would circulate and recycle hot air through vents between buildings, though it probably also led to rather poor quality breathable air. The quarry was drained by a wind-powered Archimedes screw that specially designed to sharpen knives, clean boots, power a circular saw and lathe amongst other many functions. And there was also, well, apparently a 60-foot tower central to the quadrangle and encircled by a 150 meter diameter ring of trees with two viewing platforms to accommodate up to 40 people for tea at the top, another 16 on the platform just below, um, and no doubt other refreshments. Of course, from these platforms, they could view the land around them, all that they owned and you know, their, uh, their various successes. And raised at the top of the tower, a tricolour flag symbolically raised above Union Jack. Land apparently was also prepared for a school, surrounded by a moat on which various boating exploits could be practiced, but um, this may well not have been completed or even started, and certainly archaeologically there was no trace of this, as you'll soon see. But in reality, we actually know very little um, about what was actually constructed and how this was ranged. Um, even how it was constructed as well, what sort of materials were exactly being used. Um, none of the dwellings might have looked a little something like this. These are buildings um, in March, they are derelict. Um, it would be wonderful if these could be saved because there are very few buildings from the 1830s, 1840s still standing um, across different parts of the Fenland. Um, and these are amongst the few examples. And they're, they're not bad at all, but as I say, they are derelict and access to them is rather difficult. The tithe map from 1848, which is um, after the colony was disbanded, well, this shows that there are very few buildings on the site, but I don't think this is the most accurate of maps um, for our purposes here. The 1886 Ordnance Survey map actually shows many more buildings. Um, including the building range that may have been depicted in the working bee. But if you look carefully, it's actually in an opposite orientation. It's been flipped or mirrored um, by comparison to what was actually in that illustration. Um, there might be also brickworks depicted in the three buildings near to the water-filled quarry. That's these buildings here. But of course, we have to take into account that even after the colony was disbanded, other buildings would have been erected, some buildings taken down, and this is all part of the puzzle that we're trying to piece together. On the 1886 Ordnance Survey map, there's also this later mention of St. Peter's Mission Church, which has also raised a number of queries, and well, we've not been able to find too many answers to this. 
So in other words, well, there's many unanswered questions. Now, what I'm gonna do very quickly here before I go into the archeological remains and putting those into context, specifically in relation to the colony, I want to just jump very quickly to the colony's uh, ultimate demise. Um, what happens with Hodson very briefly after his experience at the colony, um, and then we can return to this a little bit later on. Now in January 1840, this is well about two years, a little bit under two years into the, uh, the venture, James Hill, which was um, Hodson's banker, fell bankrupt. All of Hodson's assets were invested in the colony. Now this must have been a huge pressure not least because his wife thought that he was absolutely balmy, um, putting all of your investment into this type of um, expansive, expansive um, experiment uh, must have been a huge risk. And we do know that several of Hodson's children uh, died at the colony, are buried there as well. Um, so his whole life really was very much connected to this, to this venture. By 1840, given that there were problems of finance, not only in Hodson's own pocket, but the colony wasn't making enough money to pay for itself. It wasn't making enough money to pay for the debt that had been incurred by Hodson's purchase. Hodson halted orders of meat and other food to the colony in response. He took all of the account books and he resigned as president of the colony board. Now this created all manner of resentment, as you can imagine to the point that Hodson was shot at by one of the colonists. Now, in response to this, Hodson wrote a letter to the Secretary of State outlining that he had lost all faith in socialism, all faith in this colony project, um, feared for his life, and quite understandably. And there are various other news reports of violence starting to erupt amongst the remaining colonists, no doubt themselves under pressure um, for the fact that uh, you know, there's no money in their own pockets. A legal battle ensued, um, all relating to funds owed regarding the colony. And ultimately then, um, Hodson, well, he, he comes out the winner and lives on the site until 1846. So he lives there for another four years until the site is sold. Now I'll go into what he was doing there in due course, but what happens after 1846 when he sells the site is also illustrative of the character of the man um, and maybe you know gives us a sort of little bit of insight as to why ultimately the colony was not successful. And Colin, um, Hodson and his entire family and his brother and his family also uh, moved to America and in 1848 um, having taken the steamer barge from Liverpool across those, uh, those windy waves, he arrives in Janesville and sets up its first distillery and a water mill. Now there's all sorts of stories relating to his time in America and it's not time here to go into all of this. I think it suffices to say that he had multiple dealings with the government for not paying taxes, not paying distillery costs. Um, the first mill and uh, distillery that was built in Janesville mysteriously burnt down. Um, although his residence seemed to be saved from the fire. Um, the insurance that uh, was repaid from that, somewhere between five and 10,000 um, pounds. There's all sorts of stories about him placing his properties under and businesses under the names of family members and workers, all unbeknown to them. So he's a, you know, a, a pretty tricky customer. But ultimately, he is highly regarded amongst the local community. He wasn't the only person getting in trouble, particularly in relation to distillery um, tax evasion. And he seemed to do pretty well because he builds this rather magnificent property um, in the uh, township of Turtleville in a Greek revival style with 17 12 foot tall rooms, many decorated with ornamental fireplaces and walls adorned with thick walnut paneling. This photo was taken in the 1970s. Unfortunately, those buildings have since been demolished. Um, but it would be very interesting perhaps to do a project with our American colleagues who quite frankly know very little about this early period in Hodson's life. He died in 1880. Um, his tombstone is visible. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find that um, Hodson and his wife, Sarah, 
um, both have their tombstone in uh, the Turtleville Cemetery. So the archaeology. Well, we opened um, the trenches that you can see in this slide. Um, they're all you know, two meters wide up to, well, 70 meters long in one instance. Um, and there's four primary phases of, uh, of occupation represented across, um, across the archaeological signatures. It's that second phase, of course, that we're most interested in here, but I am going to touch very closely onto the 20th century occupation as well, in part because it dominates the material record, and you'll see why in just a moment. The 19th century occupation um, from 1838 onwards is also densely represented by material culture, and slight disclaimer here, actually picking out anything that relates to that 1838 to 1841 period is extraordinarily difficult. But it's the architectural remains that do offer some glimpses of hope for us being able to trace aspects of the colony. Very quickly, just to look at uh, phase one, this is the pre-colony archaeology. Um, it just illustrates that it was very much agricultural land prior to becoming occupied. We know there were one or two buildings there, but they were probably barns and certainly nothing that was um, a residence. Um, and it's traversed by various um, field boundaries and these marling pits, essentially trying to give body and weight by digging out clay, mixing it with the topsoil and the eroding peat. The peat rapidly eroding, deflating um, and losing what ultimately was good nutritious um, soil for agricultural purposes. So I'm not going to return to this. Um, we conducted quite intensive surface artifact collection. There was geophysical surveys as well of various different types. Um, and we had a, a wonderful team of volunteers, uh, many from the local Welney and Mainy communities, and others actually traveled as far from Bath um, and different parts of Cambridgeshire. So we had a, a really wonderful couple of weeks um, with a very dedicated series of people that also undertook various post-excavation activities, both in the field and back at our offices in Cambridge. Actually, let me just double say here that the surface collection give you some idea of, of quantities, um, almost 7,000 artifacts, um, half of that uh, was pottery, um, and uh, the, the total weight of all of the items together was almost 300 kilograms, uh, much to the dismay of our, our finds management team. But it is a really good, useful record that when you start to look at the distribution of that material culture, it gives you an idea of where certain activities may have taken place, where densities of um, particular material artifacts um, are located. So just giving you a, a very sort of you know, brief insight here, bone and pottery, this is by weight. Um, and you know, there's a very clear concentration of pottery uh, sort of centered towards the, the main part of the excavation area. Um, some of these um, black uh, features within the trenches themselves relate to different periods, which uh, you'll see in just a moment, but uh, it's a, a pretty clear distinction. What we had hoped to find were middens, or in other words, the, the locations where the community's rubbish was being dumped and deposited. Um, I wonder actually if much of that was being thrown into the river itself, um, given that the bone distribution here really isn't telling us anything very specific about um, the refuse of organic waste, um, butchery waste and the like. Um, it's, uh, it's still something that hopefully a future project will be able to determine. Slate and glass, so a combination of building materials and uh, well, either drinking vessels or ornamental vessels, um, as well as window glass. And again, a very distinct um, concentration towards the center of the site. Uh, much of that does relate to some of the, the last remaining buildings up into the 20th century. But, you know, we are starting to see um, a, a more broad spread as well, um, and other areas that might be suggestive of other buildings or other activities. And finally, brick and clay pipe. Well, again, brick, um, a very dense uh, concentration, although the vast majority of brick had been picked up, uh, no doubt, by um, the local farmer. You certainly don't want any of those large um, uh, sort of items in your plough. Um, but an interesting density of clay pipe towards the, the lower 
uh, southeast part of the site. Um, and we'll discuss some of those clay pipes um, in just a moment. But, you know, it's a ubiquitous uh, material that you will find on any 19th century site. So it's unsurprising that they are spread all over um, large parts of the area overall. So this is the main 19th century phase of the site. So quite large features. Um, these features towards the southern aspect of the site nearest to the river, um, probably demolition pits. And we only part excavated those. Again, that's something we'd like to return to in the future, but reasonably dated to the um, early to mid uh, 19th century. Um, various other features in light gray here, which aren't really datable. They're post holes um, and small shallow pits. Um, but again, they could be outbuildings, um, various uh, workshops and so on. Um, we do know that in the later uh, part of the, the occupation of the site, particularly in the, the 1950s, 1960s, there were chicken coops there as well. So there's a possibility that some of those are later. Um, but uh, you know, it's a, a distribution that is again very much concentrated towards the central part of the area. And these two main features um, that we excavated, they're brick lined, they're sunken into the natural geology. Um, and there's a number of pits in association to these, as well as a number of ditched boundaries. That's these dotted lines um, running across the site, um, which obviously are, are, are partitioning up different parts of that landscape. Um, unfortunately, those had very little material culture in them. They may be hedgerows, um, and uh, there might other, have been other divisions across the landscape that are not visible as archaeological features. But these brick-lined features in particular are curious. Um, I'm just going to focus on those for a moment. You can see they're not very deep. There's about three, maybe four courses of bricks. They're all unbonded. There's no mortar holding the bricks together, um, but they are pretty well structured um, and they've held, their, um, they've held their architecture relatively intact. Unfortunately, very little material culture coming from these. Um, a couple of nails, which might imply that they were at one point wooden lined. And the only sort of other features like this that we see from the 19th century, and we see this also in the centre of Cambridge when we're excavating um, 19th century buildings there, also are small cellars or um, cooling uh, pits for uh, keeping milk and other dairy products um, within a sort of degree of freshness. Um, it's possible that is what these were being used for, um, cut into the natural clay. I suspect these would also have become rather damp and pretty unpleasant, certainly in the wet season. So maybe these were purely a seasonal um, usage. But the current understanding is that these were probably inside of the buildings themselves. Um, and you'll see from the geophysics um, that there's probably a whole line of these forming part of the, uh, the building range. But it's the bricks themselves that I just want to focus on momentarily because they do tell a particular story. Many of the bricks <clears throat> had imprinted on them, well, other than fingerprints, such as in this brick, the word drain in bold letters. Now, this is important because, well, let's go back another 60, 70 years, 1784, the American War of Independence. The amount of money that was poured into this campaign by the British government was astronomical. And the debt that that incurred was long lasting. One way to recoup some of those losses, of course, was by tax. And in particular, in this instance, by tax on construction materials. In 1826, an act of parliament um, put an exemption of tax on bricks um, and tiles that were used specifically for drainage. Um, another exemption was then placed on roof tiles in 1833, and then ultimately all taxes were lifted, uh, duties on bricks in 1850. 
So that gives us a really tight timeline, 1826 to 1850, in which bricks with the imprint of drain would have been produced for exemption. However, and although they were used in vast drainage projects such as this slide, I don't think those small little buildings that we've excavated these from, or for that matter, any of the colonies buildings would have been specifically for drainage. So there's an interesting possibility here that bricks are being constructed with this word imprinted on at low cost. In other words, to exempt them from the taxation um, and then being used within the actual structures of the colony themselves. So a little bit of tax evasion taking place here. And why not? They're trying to live outside of society through radical means very independently. Um, and it's quite possible that that is what we are seeing here. The geophysics, well, it's a, a rather blurry mess, as you can tell, but there are some hot spots that correspond directly with those two uh, brick lined buildings that we excavated. And we can count a whole series of them on this row. And I like to think that this does correspond with the brick range, uh, the brick building range um, identified in the Working Bees magazine. Um, and you know, there's future thought here for potential locations to excavate in the future. So there's five or six structures here, and again, possibly inside of the main buildings themselves. But what we're not seeing, and this is curious, are the actual foundations to buildings. There were one or two sand pads, which are probably for the buildings, but they're very flimsy. In essence, what might be happening here is buildings are being erected super quickly. Utopia being built, maybe not in a day, but certainly in a rapid space of time. If you remember 100 buildings, 100 houses in two years, that's an awful lot. And there's really very little trace of the location of those buildings. So these traces through the geophysics and the trenches are really important in that instance. I'm gonna jump very quickly to the final phase of occupation or usage of the site, which is the 20th century from the 1960s to the present, because it may actually give us some insight as to where those buildings were situated. All of these dark, thick lines are plow scars. Okay, we find plow scars on many sites, but these are particularly deep and particularly uh, characterful. In other words, they are formed by a particular type of plow that I think might have been used to remove the foundations of buildings and it's being used in a very localized position, um, very specific to where the buildings may have been situated. Again, if I return to that slide, you can see that again, it's focused on that central part of the, uh, the field that we were excavating and working its way down towards again, another one of these brick features. And we don't really see it in any other parts of the site that we excavated, even though the geology is the same, the depth is the same, the character of the deposits um, are the same. So I never thought I'd get excited about plow scars, but in this instance, plow scars have proven to be really and utterly useful. And that, I suppose, is a possible indication then of where that range of buildings may have lain. And that corresponds really quite nicely with the potential demolition pits, if that's what they are. They might also be rubbish pits, again, something to test in the future. And interestingly, that we do have a pit here that we're going to refer to in just a moment. So this is an important first stage into understanding the, the nature of the colony, the nature of the buildings, and potentially also giving a sense of timing as to how it was built, but also recognizing that it actually wasn't built terribly well. So again, another view of one of these brick lined buildings um, and also a view, a half section of a pit um, that was located directly next to one of those buildings this is pit number F feature 43. And you can see that there's a number of things sticking out the side. I think that's part of a shoe, um, various bits of tile, pottery, 
um, all manner of, of, of dark deposits filled with a clinker-like material, very dark black, um, rather pungent in its smell, uh, but a really important feature. It was rich with vines. Amongst the site and including in the pit um, are various of these uh, clay pipes. Now you saw the distribution of clay pipes in the southeast uh, corner of the site, and a number of these pipes do have manufacturers' names on them, relating to manufacturers uh, predominantly in Wisbeach, or one or two in Cambridge as well. Um, this particular example produced by William Galland, who manufactured clay pipes from 1849 to 1867 uh, with his son and no doubt a small workforce. Um, now those dates, of course, uh, post-date the colony. Um, it's pretty clear that from a timeline horizon, these are not connected to that. But in a way, that's not necessarily a problem because the story has to expand beyond the colony. What's never really been queried on these ideal communities before is how does the infrastructure, which is very unique to a very particular philosophical point of view, how does that infrastructure impact upon the way that communities subsequent to communities like the colony live in these types of landscapes? Does it change the way that they um, use buildings, use landscapes, the, their discard practices, for example, um, the spatial dynamics of both discard and usage of a site? This is something that we're really quite interested in exploring. What happens after utopia? What happens after socialism effectively? Is there a different ideological view that is, uh, is traceable in these deposits? Um, if you're wondering, this item here on the, the bottom right of the screen is a, a tamper. It's got a slightly screwed end. And this of course is for cleaning out pipes and then for patting down uh, the tobacco. Um, I've only ever found one exactly like this. Um, it's on Marshall's Airfield just outside of Cambridge. So there's obviously a, a local manufacturer um, of these tampers, um, which uh, we've not been able to trace specifically, but it's uh, a, a nice, a nice item. And then other items, um, some of which are, are quite highly decorative. Um, this sort of blue and white in a, a, a very um, specific um, oriental style. This is again from sort of 1860s to 1870s. Um, and then while well, we were looking at this as maybe being the face of Utopia, um, one of these small uh, uh, ceramic dolls. Um, but again, it's not something that can be specifically datable to a, a decade or a year. Um, and it is probably also mid to late, later 19th century. And then amongst the, uh, the utilitarian sort of personal items, buttons in particular, uh, the buttons um, both made either of wood or in this instance of bone. These are from probably cow bones are certainly large mammal bones, um, the, uh, the, the long bones um, and all carved to a similar, uh, similar style, um, quite possibly made on site. And then we've got um, these sort of black and uh, pearl um, uh, made buttons, um, very stylistic. Um, pearl in the 19th century, a, a major uh, manufacturing center in Birmingham, um, all made from oyster pearl. And it's, uh, sorry, from oyster shell. Um, and the black buttons became very much in vogue um, in the 1860s, um, uh, taken after Queen Victoria's um, own attire. Um, she, of course, went to wearing black for the majority of her life um, after uh, the, the death of the king. So again, most of these seem to relate probably to the later phases of occupation. Um, and again, there's uh, good reasons for that that we'll explore in just a moment. Um, a bone handle and the only coin from the site, which actually dates to the 18th century, so possibly um, the 1770s, 1780s, um, if you can actually read what is uh, on the inscription there, then please answers on a postcard, but certainly um, the majority of us think that it is in that sort of time frame. And other items, um, working horses, um, undoubtedly found on any sort of uh, labor 
uh, manual labor site from the 19th century. Um, domestic wares, very utilitarian, as well as, again, the decorative pieces. Um, we've got the large um, storage vessels, as well as quite decorative uh, table wares. And then this key, which is a, a barrel tap key, um, probably illustrative that some form of distilling is taking place on site, which is interesting when we bear in mind that um, Hodson himself became a, a, a involved with the distilling um, industry when he was in America. This, however, is from the pit um, number 43 and is probably therefore from, well, 1850s to 1860s um, at a push. And clothing, um, quite a rare occurrence, really, um, a combination both of cloth and um, a shoe, possibly in the Balmoral style. Um, this is currently being looked at um, by um, a, a specialist, which I hope will maybe give us a, a slightly finer timeline to understand exactly um, what uh, the pit um, relates or what phase of the um, site's occupation the pit relates to. And a very particular weave construction um, within the fabric, which again is mid 19th century. So they might postdate the colony, but they do sit very nicely within the immediate aftermath, which uh, is important for our broader research aims. And when we look at the dynamics of the colony, um, its population um, from 1841, the initial uh, census um, of the colony, um, towards the, the latter phases of its, um, of its uh, colonization um, and then into the 1850s. And you can see there's this fast jump of population in the 1850s. Um, now, Hodson was on site until 1846. We do know that he built additional buildings there. A valuation of the site, which is held in the Wisbeach and Fennan Museum from 1844, um, notes that um, he built at least another three buildings. Um, and the uh, uh, the value of the whole site um, was around about £8,300. Um, it was advertised in 1846 as having a commodious farmhouse and outbuildings, nine brick and slated tenements, slated tenements note. Um, we'd always believed that prior to the 1840s, slate wasn't really um, uh, used in um, in the construction of farmhouses and residences. Um, clearly in this instance, it was, and it's Welsh slate in particular. Also listed in the auction are brickyards, kilns, drying sheds, a brew house, again, a distillery, farm, and other buildings. And it's advertised as a most desirable investment for a capitalist or man of business. There's nothing socialist about that statement whatsoever. Now, when we look at the, uh, the labour categories in the different eras, uh, we can see that obviously farmer and agricultural labour are, are, are very prominent throughout. But in the 1850s, it's interesting that uh, brickmakers are the most dominant um, labour category. Now, Hodson turned the entire enterprise into a brickmaking business, hugely successful one, clearly. And he used those proceeds to move to America. Now, Samuel Howard um, came down from Shropshire um, and took over the colony site in 1846 and transformed it yet again into another successful brickmaking factory that went into the, the 1850s. And clearly, as you can see, housing more people than ever before. It was also thriving on the construction of new rail links to the region and probably also the reconstruction of Maney Village after a devastating fire in 1853. One wonders, had the colony survived just another few years when those rail links um, were manifested, perhaps, perhaps it could have survived a little longer, but it's clearly um, a case of in-house fighting and Hodson's own personality that was the overbearing marker of its demise. The 1860s see a subsequent downturn in the, uh, the, the, the fortunes of the colony site. And we start to see that um, there are a couple of major families that start to take on um, different buildings, probably then renting out other buildings to their labourers. But we start also now to see various reports in the local press of criminal damage, assault, arrears in payments of rents, and in one case, indecent exposure. 
and I think the descendant of one of those uh, cases of indecent exposure still lives in the uh, the village of Maney today. Um, but you know, ultimately, you can see from the sale of Colony Farm in 1865 that it still had a substantial um, uh, sort of material basis um, for a successful farming output. The 20th century occupation uh, returns once more to farmland. What's important here is that after the First World War, there was this huge drive across the country to get servicemen back into social life by allocating different plots of farmland for small tenement holdings um, given to a number of ex-servicemen. Maine Colony was one of those. And I quite like the idea that it goes from a socialist commune to a vastly successful capitalist uh, business. It then sees its downturn of luck, as do many other uh, 19th century major farmsteads at this time, and then returns once more to a sort of um, socialist ideal, um, albeit with um, an independent venture in mind. And here we get to see that actually that focus of uh, um, the archaeological features now corresponds with the focus of the material deposition from our surface artifact collection. Pigs would have been the predominant species um, of animal being reared on site. That says dog, um, it's a pig, sorry about that. Um, and the upper fields of these graves, um, the pigs are, are all adult, um, occasionally with piglets thrown into the backfill of the graves. The upper fills of these graves were then used for refuse discard. And of course, we know that it was also used as a poultry farm at one point, and there are many, many of these little pits with uh, the remains of uh, chicken bones and, and other um, poultry species. And across the material assemblages, we see well, uh, a broad range of tablewares, um, some decorative, some much more um, everyday and utilitarian, um, uh, from glassware through to different ceramics. But there's nothing particularly um, high profile here, but nevertheless, items that would have been probably passed through different generations. And across the glassware, um, the full range of both kitchenwares, um, bedroom wares as well, these perfume bottles and other potions and, and sorts. Um, and anything from Heinz to Bovril, there's a Bovril jar in there somewhere, um, milk, um, Worcestershire sauce, you name it. And a lot of this now can be defined either into the 1920s or into the 1940s. Come the 1940s, another ex-serviceman takes hold of the tenancy, um, Claude Lachlan. Um, we've seen his service card record. And again, it tells of a story of the site being given over to uh, servicemen trying to find their way back into society. And he takes on board the, uh, the site until the later 1840s, um, when it is then sold into new ownership. Um, of course, by this time, the site has been broken up. The old quarry pit, which is now water filled, is owned by a, a rather fanciful millionaire um, who was in the motor industry, uses it as a pleasure zone for boating activities, um, for, for dressing up in all sorts of costumes. There's a, a, probably another story there to, to tell um, at some point in the future. And finally, we have two known photographs of the site in its last vestiges, uh, the 50s to the, the 60s. Um, the 50s was taken by a gentleman called Tebbett from St. Neots. Um, it, it took a bit of time to work out that this actually was the colony site, um, but you get a sense really here of the, remain, the remaining two buildings, probably from that building range, um, as well as a whole series of other barns and structures, and of course the chicken sheds in that final um, aerial photograph. The buildings look pretty flimsy, they're being held up by um, uh, various um, other probably timber frameworks by the latter phases. And I had the great fortune to meet um, the final children, as they would have been at the time, that lived within these properties, who described them to me as being essentially open plan downstairs with one bedroom upstairs, outside facilities, very basic, but a very happy and amenable childhood. And the Upchurch family, um, who I thank 
dearly for providing that first off that aerial photograph, um, the information and a wonderful lunch. Um, there's Roy Upchurch, Brenda Howe, Joan Bishop and Rennie Marshall, who's not featured in this pic. So it's a, a long story of occupation, abandonment, um, and then a return to agriculture. It's one that we would like to build on in the future, um, possibly with another community-led project. And I do believe that there is going to be further traces of the colony itself that will enlighten as to its story, enlighten as to the characters that were involved um, in the project itself. We've got various documentary sources that tell of how some of those characters also went to America to start up their own uh, various sort of community projects. Um, but it would be nice to know a little bit more about some of the other characters a little bit closer to home. If you'd like to know any more about the, uh, the project, there's a detailed report here. It can be downloaded at this link, um, which I'm happy to send to you or can send around this slide so you can see the, uh, the details um, in full. Um, and of course, we're grateful to the Heritage Lottery um, and the Use Washes Partnership, as well as, as well as Octavia Hill's Birthplace House in Wisbeach for supporting the project throughout. And I hope that some of you will have some questions for me, which I will do my very best to answer. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Thank you, Marcus. That was it. Very interesting talk about a, a, a very sort of difficult community to, to get a grasp on. Um, there is a question um, from Lindsay Frost that says, bearing in mind that the colony existed at the time of the rise of the Chartists, do you know if the code rules of the colony promoted the Chartist movement or was the colony apolitical? Uh, no, the Chartist movement was already in operation uh, by the time that the colony was. Uh, became you know, a reality, became manifest. But certainly there is a, a relationship between the, the ideals of the, the, the Chartism that emerged in, in the, the Northwest of England um, and, uh, and, and the movement of Owenism uh, more generally. Um, many of the early colonists did come from the Northwest and possibly had had a, affiliations and associations with, with Chartism uh, in some manner. Um, but I don't think there's any direct correlation between, let's say, an Owenite philosophy and Hodgson's interpretation of that philosophy, which ultimately was also quite individual and in a way removed from the broader Owenite um, ideal, which might also have been part of the reason for its demise, not least because it didn't have the support of the broader Owenite movement, which certainly would have given it um, a, a little bit more longevity. Um, uh, but I also imagine that many of the people coming to live in Hodson's community expected to be living uh, more closely to what they would have regarded as, a, as an Owenite philosophy. Thank you. Uh, one from me, which is sort of wonderful, I've got to answer it. Um, Hodgson uh, was sounded to be a, a kind of difficult man to, to be leading this sort of society. Would he have been more successful today, do you think, with? The opportunities to promote it via social media uh, other than the working bee or is um, communalism just not something that most people want? He well he would undoubtedly be, have been a, a very successful self-promoter um, and no doubt uh, would have correlated that with promotion of the colony itself. Um, I, I suppose one of the, the problems that he had early on was uh, that the promotion of the representation of the colony from an early, uh, from its earliest instantiations uh, was out of his hands entirely uh, for at least at least 11 months. Um, so I suppose today he would have led into the colony with a, a very strong social media um, presence um, and would have gained a following uh, that way, there's no doubt. Whether whether communi uh, this sort of communitarianism is very much uh, something that is appealing today, I think there is still a very strong appeal to it. Um, certainly some aspects of it. Um, I mean, I've, I've connected with a number of communities since this project. Uh, there's one wonderful one called Diggers and Dreamers, which um, 
when I saw the word diggers, I thought, oh, this is interesting. But then when I saw the word dreamers, I thought, well, there's a nice correlation here. And they are very much looking to, to set up different uh, communities off grid. Um, and I, I suppose it's that sense of off grid, off the beaten track, outside of um, modern life that is the attraction for many people. But whether they would want to write themselves into a contract um, in a perhaps cult-like uh, manner is questionable in this country. Um, in the US, who knows? I mean, there's a much longer tradition of these sorts of communities in the US, which have lasted a little longer um, than the ones in the UK. Um, I suppose what I didn't mention is that there were other experiments um, other than the, the Maine colony, but the only one that was really um, sanctioned by or given legitimacy by the, the Owenite movement um, was Queenswood down in Hampshire. Um, but that too only lasted a, a month or two longer than the colony. I mean, none of them really were successful um, in the 19th century. Um, I wonder how many of them today really are successful as well. I mean, one or two of them no doubt are, but um, they probably run on more fluid principles. Um, and I imagine they also have rather fluid membership. Actually, now that I think about it, there's a community that um, resides in a site called Ham Hill, which is a, a hill fort that I've been digging over the last few years um, down in Somerset. And they live in the woods on the hill slope of the hill itself. And that's been there for 30 odd years. Um, the membership changes and it had a very strong figurehead, um, but he was very, uh, very modest, um, very charismatic. Um, and it's been very successful and maybe Somerset's the place to be if you want to, to build your own uh, community. Yes, life on the fence is difficult. Somerset with cider would help, I think. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and just two other little questions. You mentioned slated roofs on those buildings. Did you find any slates there? I didn't think it was stay that you had. But... Yes, we did. I mean, it's again, it's all in the report, the sort of the specialist work. And yeah, I mean, it was according to our geologist, it was Welsh slate. Um, which I, pre-railway, that is quite unusual. I mean, certainly when you've got your own quarry, you know, you can pretty much make your own roof tiles out of the clay. And uh, there was clay roof tile as well, ceramic roof tile as well. Um, but uh, even in the, the working bee, it, it describes slate uh, roofing. So, you know, it isn't just uh, a, an expression of a later addition to the site. Um, it's interesting, and it's interesting that uh, money was, you know, serious money must have been poured into the venture, even though these buildings were built and erected, you know, with uh, with rapid pace. Um, you know, the Arnott stove was about a thousand pounds each at the time. I mean, that was an extraordinary amount of money for something like that. Um, so obviously, some of the other building materials being brought in were also of the highest standard. Um, so you know, Hudson didn't do things by halves. And as I say, he put his entire life into it, and his entire family's life savings. But he seemed to be a bit of a wheeler dealer and no doubt would have uh, you know, found a way to, to pay off his debts eventually. All right, well, thank you once again for talking to us. We, we've enjoyed that. Um, and thank you for being so patient and waiting to actually come in to talk to us because it's been a long time since we asked you to do it and then we put you back and back. But uh, thank you once again for your assistance. Oh. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And now I'd ask uh, the rest of the members to stay online, please, because we've got to have our AGM. But Marcus, I don't think we will want to bore you with that. So feel free to stay if you want to, but I'm sure you probably don't want to. I think dinner awaits and maybe a Somerset cider. So, okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.